Hey folks, how's everybody doing out there? This week, I want to talk about APIs, and in particular, REST APIs. Now, if you're not quite sure what a REST API is, don't worry. You're not the only one, and the good news for you is that uh, I think it probably doesn't matter anymore. But this is something I've been thinking about for a while now, and I've seen a couple of folks talking about it online over the last few weeks, and so now seemed as good a time as any to uh, kind of pull all these thoughts together and turn them into this video. Let's kick off with a quick recap. 1990s, the World Wide Web was invented. Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the web, actually invented three things. There was hypertext markup language, HTML. That's the bit that made web pages look more interesting than plain text. There was hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, which is the bit that browsers and servers use to talk to each other. And URLs, uniform resource locators, which told the browser which server to talk to and how to ask for the pages that they wanted. The web turned out to be pretty successful, which meant a whole lot of smart people started trying to figure out how to use those same technologies to solve other kinds of problems. And one of the most interesting problems was building client-server applications. Instead of just using a browser to browse websites, could we build rich client apps that use the same protocols and patterns as the web to talk to a central server? Turns out the answer was a resounding yes, we can. But along the way, we tried out a whole bunch of different ways to do this. One of the earliest was a thing that was called web services. If any of you folks out there remembers the simple object access protocol, SOAP, or tools like Disco, those were a very heavyweight enterprise approach to do this, lots of complicated XML. Um, I often think protocols are kind of like countries. If a country calls itself the free democratic people's republic of somewhere, it is probably none of those things. And if a protocol says it's the simple something something, it's probably not that simple. Now, in 2000, a guy called Roy Fielding published his PhD dissertation, Architectural Styles and the Design of Network-Based Software Architectures. Roy had spent the previous six years studying the architectural patterns that made the World Wide Web so successful. He'd worked on HTTP 1.0 and 1.1, he'd worked on defining the format and the structure of URLs, and his dissertation was an attempt to distill those architectural patterns into a sort of style guide for building scalable APIs. Uh, the whole thing is available online, it's definitely worth reading if you want to know more about where a lot of these ideas originated, but the section which got a lot of traction was chapter 5, where Roy defines an architectural style he called representational state transfer, or REST. Now that's the first key thing to understand about REST. REST was never a framework or a library or something that you could download. It's an architectural style. You apply certain techniques and patterns to solve certain kinds of problems, and you'll end up with something that could be considered a REST API. And one of those patterns, the one which has become synonymous with REST over the last 20 years, is hypermedia as the engine of application state, uh, HATIOS or HATIOS or however you care to pronounce it. The idea that when you get a response back from the server, you don't just get the data you asked for, you also get some kind of hypermedia included in that response that tells you what you can do with the data. If you've got page one of a set of search results, there'll be a link in the response telling you how to get to page two. If you've retrieved a resource that represents a customer, there will be links to the customer's orders, invoices, hypermedia controls maybe that let you edit or delete that customer. Now on the web, this works brilliantly. You open a website's homepage, you get a bunch of links, you get a search form, you get a login form. If you're already logged in, you don't get a login form, you get a link to my account. That's kind of what representational state transfer is. You know, the homepage is a representation of your state with respect to that application. You're not logged in. You enter your username and password, that changes your state, now you're logged in, and you are transferred to a representation of that new state. The problem is, making an API that worked this way, kind of turned out that wasn't quite so easy. Adding links and forms to a web page is trivial, because HTML defines exactly how to do that. Adding links and forms to a chunk of XML or JSON 
you're kind of on your own. Now, that's not to say there haven't been some very well-intentioned and well-engineered attempts to create hypermedia standards. Siren, Hydra, uh, JSON-LD link documents, HAL, Collection Plus JSON. Uh, there's links to all of these down in the description if you want to check them out. But none of them has come even close to being as widely adopted as HTML. Now, when it comes to whether something is a REST API or not, there's kind of always been two schools of thought. One school are the purists, the Restafarians. They will point you at paragraphs of Roy's dissertation or things that he has shared online, which make it very clear that as far as Roy Fielding is concerned, if you don't have hypermedia in your API, then it is not a REST API. And as Martin Fowler puts it, like many terms in software, REST gets a lot of definitions, but since Roy Fielding coined the term, his definition should carry more weight than most. Now, I've spent a lot of time building APIs and teaching people how to build APIs, and I've kind of always tended towards this approach. You know, build whatever kind of APIs you like, but if you're not doing hypermedia, please don't call them REST APIs. In the other camp, are the folks who use REST as a sort of uh, convenient umbrella term for whatever isn't the enterprise buzzword trend of the day. In the early 2000s, they used REST to mean it wasn't XML RPC and it wasn't SOAP. And later, folks used REST to mean it's not GraphQL or that it's not gRPC. And so now, here in 2024, you know, this is kind of where we've ended up like a, a map of API technologies and standards. This stuff over here, this is definitely XML RPC. This stuff here, this is definitely 100% GraphQL. This stuff here, this is uh, gRPC. And then in the middle, we've got the hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of solid functional web APIs that use HTTP GET, PUT, POST. They use content negotiation. They use authentication headers, but we're not allowed to call them REST APIs because we, they don't use hypermedia. And we can't just call them HTTP APIs or web APIs because technically everything on here can legitimately claim to be a web API that uses HTTP. Now, there is one project that I think has done more to promote this style of API development than anything else. And that project is, uh, it's the project that used to be called Swagger. And then the bit of the project that defines the API format specification, that was renamed to OpenAPI, but the tooling that supports it, that is still called Swagger. And you know, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that OpenAPI and Swagger has kind of done what REST was supposed to do. Oh, actually, no, not quite. I think the dream of REST was that smart API, API clients could consume hypermedia resources and build dynamic user interfaces. And, you know, as much as I hate to see it, I think that 20 years on, it turns out the best way to build this kind of dynamic user interface is to use HTML links and forms to build a web app. But what OpenAPI has done is to create a de facto standard for interactive, discoverable, well-documented APIs that work harmoniously with the fundamental mechanisms of the web, like HTTP methods and response codes and content negotiation. Roy Fielding wrote in 2008 that REST is software design on the scale of decades. And, you know, that sounded pretty good. And I don't think he was wrong. The thing is, I think very, very few organizations are actually building software at that scale. Every API I've ever built, hypermedia or otherwise, lasted maybe five years before external forces caused it to get shut down or replaced. Uh, acquisitions, mergers, changes to the technology stack or to the team running it. The scale of decades here, you know, that implies a solution that evolved smoothly from Netscape Navigator and 56K dial-up modems to Apple Vision Pro headsets on gigabit Wi-Fi. And I think there are just too many other discontinuities along that journey which you cannot mitigate by using hypermedia. Hypermedia is a fantastic pattern. For things like pagination, for linking to related resources, it's great. For building rich UIs, single page applications and mobile apps, GraphQL turned out to be a much better pattern. If you need high speed, low power, low bandwidth, you should check out gRPC. But if all you need to do is to expose data and behavior across the web, 
OpenAPI has pretty much hit the sweet spot for that. And so it kind of seems to me like we have a choice. You know, we can agree that REST means hypermedia. We can accept that very few of us actually do that properly anymore. And REST can uh, rest in peace. Or we can agree that if you're doing puts and posts and content negotiation and you are absolutely positively never returning an error message inside a 200 OK response, then if you want to call that a REST API, maybe that's all right. You see, language evolves to reflect usage. In a moment, I'm going to thank you all for tuning in. Despite the fact this is on YouTube, it's digital, and even if this was on television, nobody has actually selected a television channel by tuning a dial to a particular frequency for probably a couple of decades now. But I'm going to say it anyway. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you folks found that interesting. You have a good week. Look after each other. I'll see you next time.